Hey everyone, I am so excited to get back on track and talking with our experts. We have Jonathan Twomley with us this morning. How are you doing, Jonathan? Hey, I'm great, Michael. Good to be back. I missed you while you were gone. Oh, I appreciate that. <laughs> it, it, was, it was nice going to Taiwan, spending some time with family, really experiencing all that is Taiwan. Uh, but you know, we've got to look at real estate, right? We're real estate investors. I know you've been to Japan a couple of times, so I thought maybe we would start today talking about f our experience with foreign real estate. What do you think? That sounds good. But before we do that, I want to ask you, uh -huh. what was the best thing that you ate in Taiwan? <laughs> uh, the best thing I actually, several different times we had these, um, these, it's called hot pot. I don't know if, if Japan has them. It's hot pot. Basically it's, it's a, a boiling water that's flavored, sometimes spicy, sometimes miso. Yeah. So it's flavored water. And then when that boils, you put in, usually it's seafood, right? It's an, it's an island uh -huh. Taiwan is. So, we had several times um, hot pot with lobster in it, oh. uh, which was um, beyond expectations. And then we had shrimp and mussels and clams. It, it was uh, seafood uh, was be off the charts. So yeah, it's, it was pretty cool. Thanks for asking. Yeah, they, they do have something similar in Japan, which is called nabe. And basically it's the same thing. It's kind of like you get some boiling water and you season it and then just put in yeah. whatever you want and you boil it some more and... It's pretty good. Yeah. So that, vegetables it, and meat and stuff. It's good. Oh yeah, yeah, there were vegetables there, but I didn't mean anything. I was eating <laughs> that seafood, man. <laughs> it was pretty cool. <laughs> oh, too funny. Right. Too funny. So, so uh, go ahead. yeah, let's talk about let's talk about real estate in Asia from what we know about it, uh, yeah. just because I think it's interesting to give people a different perspective on uh, on real estate. You know, if they just have the U.S. context, it, mm -hmm. it's surprising sometimes to learn about the differences in in other countries so mm -hmm. i'm really curious to hear about what you saw in in taiwan mm -hmm. real estate yeah. wise and i yeah. can talk about what i what i know from japan i'd be awesome i'd love to hear that so uh as real estate investors been doing a couple of decades one of the things i always do when i go to a foreign market is i want to check it out right because you just you don't know what you don't know so my takeaways from really kind of three days looking actually physically looking at properties um, first, a couple of things that jumped out at me. First off, it's very vertical, right? Taiwan's an island with millions of people. So they, they've gone vertical, much like Manhattan, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so they are selling what, what I, in California, I'd call apartments. They call flats, right, in Taiwan. And they are beyond expensive. For example, uh, one of the units we looked at was right around, I tried to do the conversion from meters to feet, right around 900 square feet, two bedrooms, a living room and a small kitchen and it was going for like 1.4 to 1.5 million dollars so very expensive uh, a couple of takeaways from taiwan the market is it's very owner occupant driven um, the goal of the taiwanese people at least the circle that i was around is to own real estate uh, we were i was lucky enough to be in a circle with a couple of doctors one of those days they were both in their mid-30s uh, so slightly older older than my daughter but they were making above average income in Taiwan and yet had had saved up enough for their down payments. And they live, I would call frugally, right? So they're not out there spending tons of money. Uh, so it, it takes a lot to save up and buy a house. One of them felt they might be able to buy a house next year. So 2021. So, you know, you're, you're 35, 36 years old getting your first house. So that was, that was interesting. I immediately the next day went, oh my God, maybe there's a hole in the market. Maybe being a landlord in Taiwan is awesome. Turns out that was a fallacy because again, my circle, my trip, the people that I spoke with, they would rather live with family and save. Like the 35 year old I spoke with was in the bedroom of his parents' house, even though he's mm -hmm. a, like a doctor doctor, right? Not a, not a med student, not in his residency. No, he has been a doctor with rounds for five years and now he is teaching others. So he's a legit doctor, right? So they're going to, they would rather live with their parents until they save up enough for a down payment. So being a landlord in, in, um, in Taiwan is not the way to go. It's not, I wouldn't say frowned upon, uh, but nobody's looking to be a rentor. Uh, they, 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 it's a very family nucleus and they, they're, you know, they're very comfortable being 35, 36 year old living with their parents. And so, uh, so all those tall buildings are all condos or not rental properties. I believe. The yeah. For the most part, I did not see a building. I did not see a dedicated building that was apartments. I'm sure they exist, but I did not see one. 
So how do people make money in real estate there? Is it mostly in construction, like development? It's, it's that- mainly development. Yeah, there are some people that are, are big time builders. Uh, one of the families we had dinner, dinner with was in the construction. He's one of like the 10th or 11th yard, yard, largest builder in Taiwan. Hmm. But even at that, so I think, I think it was 11th. His kid said 10th, but he said 11th. So I'm going to believe it's 11th. But even he said he's only doing a, like 100 units a year and he usually does, does eight stories and below. Hmm. Um, so yeah, definitely developers make some money, but again, it's not being a landlord, right? If, if you're 38 years old and a doctor and you'd rather live at home with your parents than, than rent somewhere that, that tells you that being a landlord is probably, you know, a rental landlord is probably not the place to be. But what about, what about the people who are like never be in a position to buy? Cause you, you mentioned before how expensive it is. So if yeah. certain people, like if you're a doctor and you're living at, with your parents to save up for a down payment, then that suggests that for a lot of people, it's just not yeah, possible at all. Very, so they have, they have to rent. Very right? generational living. Yeah. Um, one, of the, one of the families that we had dinner with was, was kind of middle income, I, I would guess. Maybe, actually, I would probably say even upper lower, right? So they were mm. very, very much the working class. And they had, I, I call it three and a half generations there. They had grandma, the parents, kid, and they just had a newborn inside. We didn't see this place, but I'm, I'm guessing it was 700 square feet. Very mm. generational family unit living. And I'm, they just beds wherever they could put them, I'm guessing. Mm. That, that, that's been my experience. Now, I, you know, I was there for 14 days, very kind of my family oriented, skewed. But yeah, it's, it was far more family oriented than, and I'd been there half a dozen times. So I guess my eyes were just open differently now, not being there for work or, mm. you know, kind of the in and out tour. So pretty interesting. You know, I've been, I've been going back and forth to Japan since 1991. Okay. So coming up on 30 years now wow. and, um, you know, my wife is Japanese and so I spend quite a bit of time there. I probably live there for about almost four years in total altogether. Oh, wow. Plus going back for a couple of weeks every year. Okay. Uh, you know, at least for the last uh, 13, 14 years. So, and I've, I've had the chance to talk about real estate with my father-in-law, who is a, a businessman. He's not a real estate person, but he's a, he's a pretty sophisticated uh, entrepreneur. Hmm. And it's, it's interesting um, <clears throat> how, how different it is from the U S but also what, what I'm hearing, it's different from Taiwan too, which is interesting okay. given that they're right next to each other and they're both islands and, Taiwan used to be a Japanese colony. Mm -hmm. So it's, it is kind of interesting. Like Japan, for instance, is very nuclear family, like the U S right. People don't live in multi-generation households, except for out in the countryside where Uh. that still kind of persists. And people have these for Japan anyway, pretty big houses where, you know, sometimes the they'll live in, a multi-generation household and oftentimes the house is attached to their business, right? That's something that you see even in Tokyo, actually a lot of once you, if you get away from like the major centers that are all sky, you know, high rise towers, Mm -hmm. usually any shopping street will have uh, you know, a shop on the first floor and the house above it and the shop owner lives above their house. They Mm. They usually own it. So home ownership is also a big thing in Japan. Um, but there's a, there's a very healthy rental market. I mean, when I lived there, I lived in a rental property that huh. was probably, you know, like, a, gosh, there were probably 25 or 30 units in that property. And um, <clears throat> like one interesting thing about Japan is that they have uh, no zoning restrictions there. Oh. So, you know, my, the multifamily property that I lived in was, you know, in front of us was all single family homes and the back of us was a giant, you know, like 15 story apartment block, you know, next on one side, there was like a, a little like lumber business, you know, and it's just sort of all mixed in together. Oh. So I think the only places that you would get like really exclusively single family homes and stuff would tend to be in your really wealthy areas. Sure. And my, and my father-in-law was describing a phenomenon that he called, uh, he, he, it's not, it, it's, it sounds worse than it is, but he, he called it slumification. And what he meant by that actually was that 
what what you see happening because there are no zoning restrictions and because the price of land like all the value in real estate in japan is in the land oh no question right yeah. it's the houses are only built to a 30-year lifespan right and there the, there's a couple of reasons for that one is that they're constantly upgrading the earthquake uh, regulations sure so after 30 years like the you know the the tech has changed so much. I mean, you should see my, my parent, my in-laws house, which is now like 15 years old, like literally sits on, it's, it floats on springs. Wow. The whole house, the whole house is floating basically. Huh. So it's like, if there's an earthquake, the house just goes like that. It doesn't, yeah. you know, the house just floats on top of these springs, right. Wow. And, and can shift up and down or side to side, depending on which kind of earthquake it is. Right. Sure. And, yeah, yeah. but older houses that, the, the the traditional older houses there. I mean, if you, if you ever look inside some of those older houses, you'd be really scary to what you, what you find because they're built. They're, you talk about stick construction. I mean, these are built out of sticks. Oh, yeah. But the reason, the reason they were is because that was, that was actually earthquake resistant, right? Those really light structures did best in earthquakes, but now people want to have better, better heating and more yeah. windows and you know all the modern amenities. But, um, the, but people don't want to live in older houses. So there's not much of like a house resale market, right? Okay. It's more like a land resale market and people ah, tend to rebuild. So that they tend to tear down the houses unless they're pretty new and, and rebuild something else. But the slumification thing, what happens there, my father-in-law was describing to me that what will happen is because the, in desirable areas, the land is really worth so much money. Yeah. And, and in undesirable areas, it's worth almost nothing. They're literally giving it away in parts mm. of Japan. But um, in the desirable areas, what, what happens is that, um, you know, you'll have a, a large lot that had a single family house on it mm -hmm. and a developer will buy it and then they'll put up three houses on the same lot. Okay. Right? So three smaller, taller houses on the same lot. And there must be some kind of, there must be some kind of zoning because they can't, they don't just build like a tower there, but right. they but they, they can put, you know, whatever the height restriction is, they can put in three or four of them if they can fit mm. them on a lot and they're smaller. So then you wind up having people who are not as affluent yeah. as, as the last group moving in, but they're right. still homeowners, right? They're still buying their home. So it's not, it's, you know, and it tends to be like they're attracted to the area because they want to go because it's a nice area and the, mm -hmm. the schools are reputed to be good and all that kind of stuff that people worry about here too. So that's, that's one sort of interesting phenomenon as a sort of like slumification that as it's called and also the fact that people don't they don't want to live in older houses they also and and there's also like a cultural reason for not wanting to live in somebody else like a house that was somebody else owned in addition to just it being old but there's also kind of like i don't know how to describe it other other than sort of like as an ick factor that like americans wouldn't really think about but like my wife when we first got married she was very insistent on wanting to buy new construction until until like because she didn't want to live in a house that somebody else had lived in before ah. right? until i convinced her that at least in new york city like the <laughs> construction is so much better yeah. the new construction is terrible right for the most part unless you're spending you know yeah. five ten million dollars for your apartment and you get then you actually get decent construction but if you're spending less than that you get crappy construction and you know chances are, and I know this from many friends, like you're going to be in litigation with the developer yeah. you know, within the first couple of years because they did such a slipshod, you know, yeah. cutting corners job on the construction. So, um, so she didn't want to live in, you know, a, a newer, uh, she didn't want to live in an older place until I took her around and showed her the new construction and was like, Hey, look in this brand new $2 million apartment. Can you see all the cracks in the walls? Yeah. And they're like, you know, like what a crappy, and we're going to have to tear out this kitchen because they put in a terrible, you know, yeah, layout kitchen. or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And that's just layout. Like these, you know, they put in like cabinets that they basically expected to be torn out and like, you know, <laughs> yeah. it was, it was all kind. And so finally she was like, okay, let's buy an older property and, and renovate it, which is what we did. Okay. Um, and she's happy with that. But like, I, I had to convince her, that it's okay to like that the old place, older place didn't have cooties and that <laughs> it was like safe to live there. But yeah. she was, frankly, she was also worried about earthquakes. I'm like, honey, there's no, there's yeah. no earthquakes in New York. So yeah. 
<laughs> Let me show you the map where all the earthquakes are. We're yeah. on the left coast, not on that coast over there. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we do get one every once in a while, but it's just, you know, they're really small and everyone yeah. freaks out and nothing happens. But um, the, um, so there's that. But then another sort of really, so just before we get off the topic, there's two okay. other things I want to, want to mention about Japan. Sure. Uh, so what, so you've got this interesting phenomenon. One is that you've got this phenomenon now where, the population of Japan is shrinking yeah. overall, but the population of the major cities is still growing, right? Ah, Which means so that everybody, in. so, so the, the, yeah. So the countryside is getting a double whammy, right? Cause the population is shrinking plus everyone's moving to the cities, mm. which is where, you know, the, the good jobs are, where there's more fun, where there's more going on, you know? And so there are places in the countryside that are literally, giving away land to wow. people to try to get them to, to, to live there yeah, and plant roots. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, um, and it's not really working very well because well, at least what I've been reading is that people, ha some people have, you know, who are in a position like say you and I, like who have a kind of job where we could just pick up and live anywhere. <laughs> yep. um, they, people have, taken up those offers and then found that it's just very hard to break in sort of socially into these small towns where like people have all lived there for like not not just generations like centuries yeah and newcomers are it's just very very difficult for them to to adjust and plus like in small japanese towns kind of everybody's in your business right I mean, yeah it's like everybody knows everything everything about you and so it's it's hard for like the city folk to adjust to that mm. um on the other hand though like tokyo has you know it, it's funny i was thinking about this this morning because there's a some developers want to build a pretty big building right across the street from our house and okay. they're gonna they would tear down uh there's kind of like a right now there's sort of like a mega church slash religious school and an old theater that's been not used as a theater for a hundred years. And like a couple of, they bought a couple of parcels and they, they want to build like 250 unit mm. uh, property there. Wow. And so the neighborhood is all up in arms about this, right? Cause they don't want it to be built because, you know, thou shalt not build anything in my backyard. Right. And so one of my neighbors was trying to you know, convince me to come to a meeting about it. And, you know, I'm like, I have really mixed feelings about this. Like I, on the, on one hand, I don't really want this thing across the street from me. On the other hand, like philosophically, I understand that the reason that's so expensive to live in New York is nobody can build anything. Cause anytime <laughs> you try to build anything, then all the neighbors are up in arms about it. Right. Exactly, so exactly. I was thinking about that this morning and in Japan, they there, this doesn't exist. Right. Yeah. You don't, the, the neighborhood doesn't have the right to go and like stop a developer from developing mm. and, and people are frankly just, used to it. And so as a result, there's a lot of construction in, in Tokyo. They don't have this issue of prices spiraling out of control because all these people are moving in and they've got no place to go. Right. And rents in Japan are actually, as a result, cheaper now than they were when I lived there 30 years ago. That's amazing. So you can, you can for what I've spent in rent 30 years ago, I could have got a much bigger place so this is now. absolute dollars or are we doing the inflation adjusted gain uh it's it's in the actual price wow. like the actual prices right so not real prices like nominal prices so right. um, i mean they've had almost they've had very little inflation in japan yeah. over the last 30 years but still it adds up to something right i mean mm -hmm. and um so they they've had and the, and there's stuff probably where the inflation is is like in the newer properties but they're Bigger okay. and nicer and better than, right than, than what you used to be able to get. Yeah. And the um, and, and nobody is like, you know, crybaby. You know, like <laughs> acting like a crybaby when when a new tower goes up. And they're like huge towers, right? When I yeah. lived in Japan, there were no tall apartment towers. There were some, but they weren't. You know, it didn't have like 30, 40 story towers. Right. Which you have now. And at that at the time, people said. Oh, it's because we're afraid of earthquakes and stuff. Uh, yeah. But but they the construction standards they have very you know very oh, sure like unlike say California where they have like super strict uh, you know construction standards for earthquakes, but also it's still impossible to build anything. Like in Japan, it's the the thing they focus on is the safety. 
Yeah. Right. And, but the rest of it is like build what you want. Right. No, so, I, yeah, I agree. It's, so it's, the, it's interesting. I, Both New York and, and the Bay area, San Francisco specifically suffer from not in my backyard. Yeah. And it's, and the, the same people who complain about uh, it's so expensive are the first people who rush out and say, don't build anything near me. Yeah. Right. And, and it, it just, it doesn't make any sense. And I think, I think there's just a disconnect. I don't think a lot of people really are thinking about the connection between like, don't build anything anywhere near me. And Oh my God, like the rent is too damn high. Yeah. Right. And the rent is, it always seems like the rent is too damn high is like, Oh, well then let's make the landlords lower the rent yeah. or cap, cap the rent somehow. And that's, that's, it's just that's treating the symptom. It's not treating the disease. Right? Well, it's, it yeah, it's treating the symptom in a horrible way. Yeah. Yeah. Because what you ultimately do is you remove more supply, which is yeah. just bad shit yeah. crazy. It's, it's, it's totally backwards. And I mean, I look around, I look around Brooklyn where I live and I see like, okay, look, there, there are a few very limited neighborhoods that have some kind of like architectural distinctiveness, right. Yeah. That have that, 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 that I think like, should be preserved under some kind of historical preservation law. But other than those neighborhoods, right, there's really no reason why, like the, the neighborhood where I used to have my office until recently was largely industrial. All the housing there was built. It was all like, you know, built for the workers who worked on the docks in Brooklyn, right? So it was very, low quality construction, cheap, low, co- well, low quality construction. We can get into a debate about whether we should have more of that because I think we should, mm-hmm. right? Because people need cheaper places to live. For sure. But it also means that today, like there's no reason to save these houses. They have no, there's no, nothing distinct about them. Right. There's nothing like, there's nothing, you know, we're not going to lose a piece of our history if they were all replaced with, you know, newer stuff, to- yeah. or towers, yeah. right? And they're all on the subway. You can get into Manhattan super easy from there. Mm-hmm. It, it makes no sense for them not to be, to be redeveloped in, in more of like a, a free for all kind of way. Yeah. Um, and that, and you want to talk about like lowering the price of housing, like that would do it. But oh, no if you, you know, if they want to, but there's like, you know, there's like a couple of neighborhoods that have some architectural distinctiveness or like another is like the West village in, in Manhattan. Like that's a very mm-hmm. architecturally distinct, you know, kind of area. And, and I think there's a good argument for preserving it, but outside of that, like there's not, maybe there's a few streets on the upper West side that kind of like are the same thing, but basically it's like yeah. not, there's no real reason not to build more and build higher. And um, yeah, you know. I think, I think that's an interesting connection. And again, I think, you know, all these people in San Francisco, Bay Area, New York, who are voicing, you know, rents are too high, landlords are greedy, blah, 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 rent control, stop evictions. All these things are going after the symptom, not the problem. And I think you're right. I mean, Japan's an example, and I'm sure Taiwan's the same way. Uh, There's not this overarching, not in my backyard phenomenon. and, And we haven't been spoiled where we can just scream, yell, squawk to stop a developer because it is, it's a supply problem. It's always been a supply problem. Yeah, and um, it's it's pretty telling to think about Japan in that way that rents are lower thirty years later. I mean, that's if anybody needs to hear about what you know, not in my backyard is causing. Just think about that. Japan's rent is yeah. cheaper thirty years later. That's and, all you need to know. <laughs> and and listen, the the other thing, the other part of this is part of the reason I think part of what's behind the not in my backyard phenomenon is that people also know that like the infrastructure won't get built to support the additional population <laughs> yeah. because people are like, Oh, well, you can't, you can't tax me to pay for that. Right. So it's, it's the kind of like, we want it all, but we don't want to pay for anything. Yeah. Whereas in, in Japan, now, I mean, obviously they have huge deficits, but they're, you, I mean, it's like they're building subway lines constantly in Tokyo, like, yeah. like all the time. Yeah, I've seen Every the map I, last year. I was there. It's like, Oh my yeah. God. Every time I go back, there's a brand new subway line somewhere. And it's, you know, like there's not a problem getting around when they, if they add, it's not taxing the infrastructure because they're building the infrastructure to support the Mm -hmm. population. Right. And, you know, in Japan, the problem is 
where they have, you know, like, it's like here, like the rural areas are have too much political power and they get a lot of money spent on them. That's, that's just wasted sure. you know, because of, because of politicians. So they spend a lot of money building like brand new highways and bridges and stuff like that in areas where like people are leaving, you know, because it's yeah. like a, it's a sop to the local politicians who, you know, who are like mm-hmm. probably pretty powerful, but you know, so, so they're spending a lot of money wastefully on stuff like that. It's like, the, you know, like the bridge to nowhere that we heard about in Alaska a few years yeah, ago. I There's a lot of bridges to nowhere in Japan. Um, but, it, but in the cities, they are building infrastructure, which they're just not doing here. You know, okay. and in New York, like we're finally building the second Avenue subway, which has only been on the, on the, the plant, I mean, the plant since the 1930s. Oh my God. And <laughs> It's finally going to be finished, I think, next year or the year after wow, that. They opened crazy. a piece of it recently, but it took, you know, because like nobody wants to pay taxes for anything mm-hmm. and y- you get what you pay for, right? I mean, yeah, you get what you, you know, so. Yeah. Well, talking about feeding the symptom, this is going to be a total left turn. So we didn't prep or yeah. plan for this like, like normal. But did you see that Seattle just passed a law preventing evictions during the winter. Did you see that? I, well, I did because, it, because my Facebook group totally blew up this morning over this <laughs> and did. with people like calling each other names and all sorts of stuff. And I, <laughs> I shuddered. To th- I haven't looked at it for a couple of hours, but so I shudder to think what I'm going to find when I go back. I already, I already had to kick somebody out because, was, yeah. he, because he was being really uncivil, which I don't allow in my group. Yeah. But, awesome. um, but people were, uh, yeah, people were getting very upset about this issue. And, and again, it's sort of like, it's, it's, the problem is not, the problem is that they're not building enough to satisfy, you know, to, to accommodate the population exactly. of, of the city. And they're, they're, and they're saying, well, we're just going to take it out of the landlord's hide. Right. I think, and I guess landlords are an easy target because people feel like, oh, you just own this property and you're not doing anything. And yeah. so it's, so it's like, you don't really just deserve that money, but, and then there were people getting very, there was one guy getting very exercised about like re- the idea of rent being theft. And I'm like, come on. Like if, if I say to you, I, here's my house, right? I have an apartment above me and I'm going to rent it to you. If you, and you can stay there if you give me money. Yeah. Like, I'm not sure exactly how I'm stealing from you, or, you know, if, if we make that agreement and also I'm not really sure how, you know, it benefits anybody for you to then say, okay, you know what, I'm not going to pay you rent, but I still deserve to live here because you're an evil person who owns a house. Right. So like, it just, you know, yeah, it's, it's really, yeah, there's, it's the, frustrating to me that these, yeah. these, these very populous, I mean, because first off, you have to step back and go, okay, why? Well, first off, okay, I, I'm a human being. I understand Seattle gets cold. I understand being removed from a house because of an eviction uh, could potentially make, make, have you live in your car, right? I guess I it understand. Sucks. Yes, yeah, it's a terrible it. thing to happen. Yeah. Shelter is a basic need. Totally understand. Uh, but to now go in and enact a law out of nowhere that says you can't evict anybody for five months right? November 1st to April 1st. I'm like, great. What you've just done, Seattle, is you are going to have a lot less rental units because if I owned anything in Seattle, I would start evictions on everyone April 2nd. I would fix them all up and sell them owner-occupant. Your economy is doing so well, Seattle, that you have a, you have a problem with not enough housing. And if you're going to make it impossible for me to you know, get people out of my houses, I can fix that. I can sell them owner-occupant and I would do it in a heartbeat. Because that's what you want me to do. That, you're telling me being a landlord in Seattle is bad. So I'm going to stop yeah. being a landlord in Seattle. Thank you very much. Yeah. And look, I mean, if you're telling people like you can't be evicted for five months, that's just saying, okay, five months free rent, right? For the, 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 the wrong kind of people, right? Mm-hmm. Who are going to take advantage of something like it's that. It's probably more like say, seven months, right? Because you can't start the eviction, right? Because right? then you're going to start it. And then you got two months till they're out. So you, you, hey, congratulations. You want to raise? Come, come, be a, come be a tenant in Seattle and live rent-free for six months. Yeah, it's, it's, it's so short-sighted, you know. But it's, it's again, it's because, at, you know, at, at root of it, I think, is this NIMBY problem. Yeah. And, and the politicians, you know, no politician wants to be, you know, seen as being 
side of the developers, right? And and because mm-hmm. that's just seen as corrupt. I mean, it's funny, you know, Mary de Blasio here in the city ha- has various problems, but one of his problems, ironically enough, is that people think he's too close to the developers in the city, oh. right? He has this reputation as being very, like very, very liberal, but he's at the same time, he's attacked for being cozy with the developers, huh. right? And um, cause he, and he's always, he's always been, uh, I, I don't know if cozy is the way to describe it. He's always been kind of like a pro yeah. development guy. Right. And so, but he, he gets it, he gets it from both ends now, wow. because, you know, cause on the one hand, the conservatives are upset because, Oh, he's like making rent control worse. And the liberals are upset because he's cozy with the developers and like, oh you can't, you can't, you can't win. And I think, <laughs> you know, I think you see a lot of this, like the, the, the politicians don't want to stand up to, they can't stand up to the nimbyism, right? Yeah. Cause it's, it's a quick way to get defeated if you, if you stand up to nimbyism, but so then, but then people are complaining about, well, the rent is too high. Uh, so, you know, and the, the middle class is leaving. Well, so then what happens? Well, let's, yeah. It's almost like what else is left to do? Like if you, if you, if you can't, if you don't have the courage to deal with that first problem, then, you know, and you're, and people are willing to like demagogue the nimbyism thing. Yeah. And it, it kind of leaves you almost no choice, but to go after the landlords. And of course, like, because of nobody wanting to pay taxes for anything, yeah. then, you know, you can't as a city also say like, well, we have a public policy in favor of low income housing that we're going to go build as yeah. a city. Right. Because people are like, Oh, we want to pay taxes for that. And, you know, Oh, I don't want that guy living on my dime. And, you know, so it's like everybody is to blame, frankly, yeah. in my, in my view, it's, you know, the, it, people point fingers like, Oh, it's the liberals or, Oh, it's the conservatives. Frankly, they're all doing the same stuff. The NIM, yeah, every, everybody's a NIM, everybody's a NIMBY. I, I've yet to hear, you know, I've yet to encounter like the, you know, the conservative, let like, build it all guy who yeah. is um, like in favor of the project next door to his house. No, I agree. I you know totally I mean? agree. So Th- this is actually a comment I got this morning, again, coming out of total left field. You and I both are obviously New York, California, or what is often referred to as a blue state, right yeah. or wrong. That's just the states that we're in. So somebody said on a comment to my video, like 10 minutes before I started this was, should I invest in a red state instead of a blue state? I'm like, I never thought of it that way. And I don't know if you've thought of it that way. Cause again, I never, I didn't prep you for that. Any, any first blushes at red state versus blue state as a landlord? Well, yeah. I mean, I think there's some definitely obvious advantages to investing in the red states, which, and I do, I mean, I, you know, I, I have invested only in South Carolina oh, and part of it is, you know, the main reason was because it's just cheaper and easier to make money than in, in New York. Sure. But another issue really is like just that, as a landlord, you get as a as a landlord of larger properties, right? Mm-hmm. If, if you own if you if it's an owner occupied property, it's different. Sure. But if if you um, as a commercial landlord, it is much easier in a place like South Carolina, where the the basic law is like you don't get to live there unless you pay your rent. Right. Whereas in New York, it's possible to to game the system, you know, very, very badly. And, you know, so, and that just, so, and all that does is just make, it just perpetuates the problem because then it makes, you know, landlords demand, you know, more deposits. They, they have much stricter credit checks, like the income requirements are outrageous and all because they're trying to basically prevent themselves from ever being in a situation where they need to evict somebody because it's so difficult. To evict. Whereas in South Carolina, usually the case is, you know, if you if you if you have an eviction filed against you, you've got like one chance to come running into court waving a check and saying you're on your own, I'll pay. And the second time, the judge is gonna be like, I'm not gonna yeah. be here every month with you doing this. So uh, I don't want to see you here again. Right. Whereas in New York, you know, people can get the default is you can't evict them yet. Right. That's kind of like the default. Like they, they, they are entitled to more time to 
to come up with a rent. It's kind of the default situation. So it takes six months or more to get somebody out oh. as it is in New York. Wow. So, uh, cause it's just too, that's even beyond the rent control issue. Right. And, sure. and um, so it, I, I, nevertheless, there are lots and lots and lots of people who want to invest in New York city as, and I'm sure it's the same thing like in mm-hmm. San Francisco, For sure. like, because there is money to be made here. It's, it is just a different kind of investment than you know i want to do i think you know new york may be okay for like okay i'm going to buy a brownstone and live in it and offset part of the rent with renting the rest of it out and right i figure i'm going to be here forever and it's going to go up over time sure you know but it's even that i think like at this point in the market is a mm-hmm. little dangerous thing to do but um but as a commercial you know anything that's over six units then you get into just all kinds of regulations and uh, it, it just becomes a lot more difficult in addition yeah. to it being expensive. It doesn't mean it's like cheaper because it's over six units. It's right. still very expensive. So, so should I invest in a red state versus a blue state? I mean, you can't make a blanket statement about it. It depends on what it is that you want to do. Mm-hmm. But if you're looking for like the, yes, the answer is if you don't want to deal with evictions, in in that kind of way then yes invest in a in a red state because they're just more landlord friendly for sure just that's just the way it is very very cool jonathan this has always been fun we start off talking about taiwan japan then we go off to not in my backyard and we close with red versus blue state i I always love our conversations thank you so much you're welcome i can't believe we already it's already been 45 minutes so uh (laughs) it's always fun (laughs) it's always fun and you enjoy london next week with your daughter that's going to be awesome I will. I, so I'm sorry I'll miss our call next week, but we'll pick up the week after that and I will definitely enjoy London and maybe even come back with some real estate observations from, from London too. I look forward to it, man. Thanks. All right. Take care.